The topic of this video is hypothesis testing. And in this introduction, we're going to look at the individual components of a hypothesis test. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a hypothesis test for one sample. And in uh, another video later, I'll, I'll talk about hypothesis testing for uh, multiple samples. So I want to go through the basics of this idea of hypothesis testing. So a hypothesis, it's some declarative statement about a population parameter. It could be about the mean, it could be about the uh, proportion, at least half means 50% uh, or more, the standard deviation, it could be about the uh, the median, the correlation coefficient, it could be about any population parameter. And a hypothesis test, it's a procedure for testing the validity of a claim. Now, the first thing we start with is this claim that's being made about a population. Now, we want to write that claim symbolically using an equal to, not equal to, or an inequality symbol. So, for example, with these, these three statements, these are all claims. And these claims could be written symbolically. The average weight of a nickel is 5 grams. So, average means mean. So, mu equals 5. At least half of the Northeastern student population rides the T. So, the proportion is greater than or equal to 0.5. Uh, the standard deviation for GPAs is less than 0 0.22. Okay, so once we have the claim written symbolically, uh, then we can begin our hypothesis test. And it's a probability-based predictive approach, which involves some possibility of error, and we'll talk about errors a little bit later. So we start off with the, with the hypothesis about an unknown population parameter. And from that population, we take a sample of data. And that sample is going to be used, and we're basically determining whether the sample data is strong enough to support or, uh, or, or, or reject the claim that's being made or the claim that's being analyzed. Uh, in general, we almost never know the true value of a population parameter. If we, if we knew the true value, we wouldn't have to do a hypothesis test. Now, we usually estimate them. And in the last unit, we talked about estimating parameters. Well, it was with the confidence intervals. Uh, but we do have an idea or a hypothesis about what those true values of the population parameters are. Now, there's going to be two competing hypotheses, and we'll define those shortly. And we're going to use the sample data to choose between those two hypotheses. Now, the first hypothesis, this is like the default hypothesis. This is what you assume is true unless you have a reason to, to believe otherwise. This is called the null hypothesis. And the symbol for the null hypothesis is the H with the subscript of zero. Now, you can think about the null hypothesis in the same way you think about someone who is, uh, who is going to court. Now, in this country, a person going to court goes into the court, uh, the, the court case under the assumption that they are innocent until proven guilty. Okay, so the null hypothesis would be this person is innocent, but if there's enough data, if there's enough evidence, you reject that hypothesis, and then your alternate would be this person is guilty. So we assume the null hypothesis is true. And if we're able to determine that the null hypothesis is not true, then we fall back on our plan B, the alternate hypothesis. Uh, some books use a capital H with a little a, some books use capital H with a little one. Uh, we're going to use H1 for the alternate hypothesis. 
So this should be the beginning step of the hypothesis test. Based on the claim, you state the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. Now the null hypothesis, that's the easy one because it's always a statement of equality. So your null hypothesis will always be maybe mu is equal to some number or proportion is equal to some number. These are the two I'm gonna talk about uh, in this video, uh, the mean and the proportion, but it could be involving the standard deviation is equal to some number, the correlation coefficient is equal to some number, etc. cetera. Uh, but we're gonna focus on the mean and the proportion. Now we test that null hypothesis in, in, in such a way that we, we uh, like I said, we assume it's true, then we analyze the data, and then our conclusion is whether or not we reject that null hypothesis. Okay, and like I said, a, a defendant in a jury trial is assumed to be innocent until proven guilty, so the null hypothesis would be this person is innocent if the evidence is strong enough, you reject that statement, and the alternative would be the defendant is guilty. Now, it's important to note that innocence is never proven. So the outcomes are not guilty or innocent. The possible outcomes in a court case or a jury trial would be guilty or not guilty. So we're not, um, we, have to, we have to be sure that we're clear on what it is uh, we're able to prove. And we'll, we'll get to that later when we talk about the different conclusions of a hypothesis test. Now, there's gonna be, a, I'm gonna talk a lot about this decision of whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. That's not the final step. And that rejecting the null hypothesis does not mean the original claim is false. Uh, we'll see what leads to that uh, that conclusion or what leads to the conclusion that the original claim is true. Okay, so here's our, uh, you know, this is the definitions, the null and the alternate hypotheses. Now we've talked about these already. Uh, so this is where you start with the hypothesis test. The null hypothesis is what you expect to be the case unless the data is strong enough to support or to say otherwise. Okay, so the null hypothesis is always a statement of equality. The alternate hypothesis is always a statement that does not contain equality. So the original claim could contain a greater than or equal to symbol or a less than or equal to symbol, but the, the alternate hypothesis cannot. The alternate hypothesis is going to be a statement that looks like either the mean is equal to some number, the mean is less than some number, the mean is greater than some number, and we could replace mean with any other parameter, proportion, standard deviation, whatnot. Okay, so for example, and I'm gonna use, I'm gonna refer back to this example a couple of times. But assume that 100 babies are born to 100 couples treated with an XSORT method of gender selection that is claimed to make girls more likely. So basically, if you're planning to have a child, but you want to have a daughter, you could go to this fertility clinic and use their method. They call it XSORT, pay them a lot of money. And if you use their treatment, it increases your chances of having a girl. Okay, so that is a statistical claim that's being made. Make girls more likely. Okay, so the claim is that the proportion or percentage of girls is not 50%. It's actually greater than 50%. So that's the claim. Now the question is, does the data support that claim? Well, in the last 100 customers, where you would expect 50 boys and 50 girls, there were actually 58 girls and only 42 boys. 
So the last 100 customers at this fertility clinic saw 58% of births being girls. Now, this is sort of close to 50-50, so maybe this could occur by chance, or maybe this is uh, very unlikely to occur by chance. We'll see. Okay, so we're testing the claim that the proportion of girls is greater than 50%, which would be the proportion that we would expect if there was no treatment. Okay, so we started off with the claim proportion greater than 50%, and then we move on to the hypotheses. And like I said, the null hypothesis is always a statement of equality, and the alternate hypothesis is either going to be greater than, less than, or not equal to. Now, if the claim contains one of those three symbols, then the alternate hypothesis will be the same as the claim. So in this case, the alternate hypothesis is the same as the claim. All right, so they're all related to each other. Uh, the claim determines what the null and alternate hypothesis, hypotheses are. And if you're conducting some sort of experiment or study and you want to, if your end goal is to support the claim, then the claim must be the alternate hypothesis. You know, that's not something we're really going to have to deal with because we're not going to be determining what, you know, we're not going to be deciding what the claim should be. You know, in the context of this particular class, when you're presented with a hypothesis test, the claim will be given to you. Now, how do we choose whether to keep the null hypothesis or whether to reject it and go with the alternate hypothesis? So again, the standard approach, assume the null hypothesis is true, that's your default hypothesis or your plan A, unless you're given a reason to think otherwise. Okay, so since this method is probability-based, it is possible to make a mistake. It's, pro it's possible to be wrong, but we're using the fact and we're going to structure the hypothesis test in such a way that the likelihood of being wrong will be very small. But it is possible to make a mistake. If you think about going into a uh, doctor's office to be tested for something, let's say you think you have the flu and you want to go and get tested to see if you actually have the flu. Well, four things could happen. You could be positive, and you could test positive. In that case, the test is correct. Or you could be negative, and you could test negative. In that case, the test is also correct. Or the test could be wrong, and it could be wrong in two different ways. You could be positive, but test says you are negative. That's a false negative. Or you could be negative and test positive. That's a false positive. So these type 1 and type 2 errors, these are like a false positive and a false negative. Sometimes the test is wrong. So in a type 1 error, that's when you actually reject the null hypothesis when you're not supposed to. And the probability of that happening is alpha. Now this alpha, we're familiar with this. This is the same alpha we used in the previous unit when we discussed confidence interval estimates. So alpha is called the significance. the significance of the hypothesis test, that's, that's alpha. That's the type of error that we're gonna focus on. The other type of error is when you don't reject the null hypothesis, but you're supposed to. The probability of that 
we use the symbol beta. So alpha and beta are the probabilities of a type one and a type two error. Uh, this is a visually, uh, this sort of this idea of the, the, of the correct test or the false positive or the false negative. So when the null hypothesis is true, but the hypothesis test says reject it, that's a type one error. And so the probability of that happening, that is alpha. Or if the null hypothesis is not true, so we're supposed to reject it, but through our hypothesis test, we fail to reject it. That's a type two error. So again, alpha is the probability of a type one error. You could think about this like a false negative. Beta is the probability of a type two error. Type two error. You could think about that as a false positive. Okay, but like I said, we're gonna we're gonna focus mainly on this type one error because we're gonna have to use this this value of alpha is going to be part of our um, of our hypothesis test. They're related to each other. Uh, when the likelihood of one goes up, the likelihood of the other one goes down. So they're inversely proportional. But as always, increasing the value of n, meaning getting or gathering more and more data, decreases the chance of an error. All right, and so like I said, alpha is the significance level of the hypothesis test. And that's gonna be, uh, we're gonna use this value of alpha to choose our critical values. And I'll talk more about critical values shortly, but they're the same critical values that we've used previously. So this level of significance or the probability of making a type one error, it's the probability that the test statistic <coughs> and the test statistic is our, it's a, it's a numerical representation of the sample data. So we're basically gonna take the sample data and convert it to one single number used to represent that sample. We're gonna call it the test statistic. And the significance level is the probability that the test statistic will fall in the critical region. And this probability distribution that we're gonna use as the backdrop here is the normal distribution, the same normal distribution we've seen before, the same one we used in the context of confidence interval estimates. So for example, and in this example, this hypothesis test is two-tailed, meaning alpha is split between the two tails of the normal distribution. So if the hypothesis test is two-tailed, you could visualize it like this. You could visualize it as samples that are likely to occur with those that are unlikely to occur. And it's normally distributed because our distribution of sample means we saw uh, back when we studied the central limit theorem, the distribution of sample means is normal. Okay. So there are going to be three types of tests and those are right tail, left tail, or two tail. So like I said, if it's a two tail test, then alpha is split between the two tails of the normal distribution. Now you determine which of these three you use based on the sign that's used in the alternate hypothesis. Once you have your alternate hypothesis, that tells you which type of test to use. So if it's 
If your alternate hypothesis uses the symbol not equal to, it's a two-tailed test. If your alternate hypothesis uses a less than symbol, then alpha is on the left, and it's a left-tailed test. If your alternate hypothesis uses greater than, then alpha is on the right, and it is a right-tailed test. Now, the, the one-tailed tests, you know, typically are, are, are favorable because they tell you a little bit more. So saying something is, saying two things are not equal doesn't tell you which one is bigger or which one is smaller. But saying, but using, like, for example, a greater than, you know, if, if, if A is greater than B, well, that also implies that they're not equal to. So greater than means not equal to, but also tells you more than just not equal to. It tells you the relationship between the things. Okay, so the components of the hypothesis test. There's the test statistic. And this is coming from your sample data. And we'll talk about the formula you use to calculate this. But the test statistic is basically you take your sample data and convert it into one single numerical value. The critical value, that's coming from alpha. So alpha is an area and we know how to take an area under the normal distribution and, and convert it to a z-score or a t-value if we're using the t-distribution. Okay, formula for the test statistic. In general, the test statistic for any parameter is always equal to the difference between the sample statistic and the hypothesized population parameter divided by the standard error between the statistic and the parameter. That's the standard error. It's the same standard error that we discussed uh, a couple of chapters ago when we covered the central limit theorem. So specifically what those formulas look like for uh, the mean, let me just go forward for a second. Yeah. So the test statistics that we're going to use, if you're testing a claim about the proportion, it's going to be a z-score. And if you're testing a, a hypothesis about the mean, it's going to be, well, a t-value or a z-score depending on whether or not you know the value of the population standard deviation, just like with our confidence interval estimates. If you know sigma, then you use the normal distribution, so it's, you're using z-scores. If you don't know sigma, then we're using the t-values. Now we want to, once we calculate that, we want to determine does that test statistic fall within the critical region? Okay, so this is called the traditional approach or the traditional method for using a hypothesis test. It's comparing, let's see, where was it? It's comparing these two. Okay, so uh, it, shortly I'll talk about, you know, what the result is when one of these is bigger than the other. But basically, if we're taking the traditional approach, we have to calculate the test statistic we have to determine the critical value and compare those two numbers. Okay. The second method is called the p-value method, p for probability. Now it's very similar. I mean, these, these are not two distinctly different methods. In, in both cases, you need the test, the test statistic regardless but 
in the traditional method, you're comparing the critical value and the test statistics. So you're comparing two Z scores or two T values. With the P value method, you're comparing two areas. And it's, it's not like these two methods are mutually exclusive because, and we've talked about this quite a few times by now, If you know, if you know the area, you could find the z-score, and if you know the z-score, you can find the area. If you know one, you could easily find the other. So these are not two distinctly different methods. One uses z-scores, the other uses area, but like I said, it's just, it's two ways of looking at the exact same thing. Now, the p-value, like I said, the p-value is an area, and it depends on whether your test is uh, one-tailed or two-tailed. But basically, if your test is one-tailed, so one tail would be a left or a right, your p-value is this area right here, the area outside of the test statistic. Doesn't matter if it's a right tail or a left tail, if it's a one tail test, it's the area outside of your test statistic. And if it's a two tailed test, if it's a two tailed test, then your p value is twice that area outside the test statistic. So if it's a one-tailed test, you use the area. If it's a two-tailed test, you double the area. So now, sort of the at the center of this hypothesis test is the question, do I reject the null hypothesis? So that's a yes, no question. Yes or no. Do I reject the, the null hypothesis? So that's good. That's an important and central component of the hypothesis test. Now, if you're using the traditional method, comparing two Z scores or two T values, let's say you reject the null hypothesis if one of these two things happen. And if one happens, then the other one has to happen as well. So it's not like there's going to be a case where you have to look at one versus the other. But if the test statistic, that's your sample data, the test statistic is coming from your sample data. If that is more extreme, further from zero, either more positive or more negative, then you reject the null hypothesis. And if the p-value is less than alpha, the level of significance, you would also reject the null hypothesis. So if p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null hypothesis. It's, again, it's just two, two slightly different methods to do the exact same thing. Okay, so let's come back to this example. Assume that 100 babies are born to 100 couples. We talked about this. We observe this sample data. Sample data. 58 girls out of 100 babies. So the actual percentage of girls is 58%. Now, use a 0 0.05 level of significance to test the claim. That has to be given to you every time. Just like with the confidence interval uh, estimates, the level of confidence was always given to you in the context of hypothesis testing. In this class, the level of significance will be given in the problem every single time. So we wanna test the claim that if you use this treatment, the proportion of girls is greater than 50%. 
Okay, so step one is to interpret the problem and state the claim symbolically. That is step one. So we said P is greater than 50% or 0 0.5. Then you move on to stating the null and alternate hypotheses. The null hypothesis is always a statement using an equal sign. And in this case, the alternate hypothesis, so null and alternate, the alternate hypothesis is, in this case, the same as the claim, 0.5. Okay, once you have your hypotheses, this alternate hypothesis is telling you, it's a right-tailed test. So greater than means right tailed. And then we need our test statistic. So we calculate our test statistic using the formula. And that's gonna be our representation of the sample data. So if we, um, in this case, P hat is equal to 58% or 0.58. P is equal to 0 0.5. Q is the complement of that, which is also 0 0.5. And N is 100 because there's 100 births. Okay, so we convert that, uh, the sample data to this test statistic, which is a z-score. And we get 1.6. So this 58 girls out of 100 births, that's converted to the z-score 1.6. Okay, so now, now that we have our test statistic and we know it's a right tail test, And we know how to find the area to the right of that test statistic. That area is the p-value. And we know how to find that p-value using Excel, 0, 5, 4, 8. And that's equal that's equal 1 minus norm dot s dot d i s t 1.6 comma 1. We need the 1 minus because that normal distribution function will give you area to the left. Excel is always area to the left. So the 1 minus will give us the complement of that or the area to the right. That's the same Excel function we used in the last unit on confidence interval estimates. And before that, with the central limit theorem and the normal distribution probability problems. Okay, so our critical value of 1.645 is above the value of the test statistic. So our sample data put us right here, which means our sample results were not strong enough to reject the null hypothesis. If we had more data, perhaps it would be. Okay, so that's basically, that is the second to last step.
in the hypothesis test is determining whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. That's not the end. That's not your answer. It's the step before your final answer. I mean, there's no more calculations. Now it's just interpretation. So based on the fact that we did not reject the null hypothesis, well, what happens? Now you're going to want to refer back to this flow chart every time you do a hypothesis test. So there's two questions. Step or question number one, does the original claim contain equality? No, the original claim contained greater than. It did not contain an equal sign. So we say no, we go down here. And this path is, is out. Next, do you reject the null hypothesis, yes or no? And in this particular problem, with this claim, we ended up not rejecting the null hypothesis. So that puts us down here. And so this would be your final answer. There is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that this method increases your chances of having a girl. Okay, so what that means is the test was inconclusive. Now in practice, when that happens, that just means Go get more data. We couldn't support or reject the original claim because we didn't have enough data. And that's actually two of the four cases, two of these four final conclusions involve the test being in conclusive. Okay, so that's, that's basically the individual components of the hypothesis test. And we actually went through a hypothesis test, you know, towards the end of this video. Your final answer, when you do a hypothesis test, your final answer has to be one of these four statements. So your final answer is either there's sufficient evidence to reject the claim, there's sufficient evidence to support the claim, or there's not sufficient evidence to reject the claim, or there's not sufficient evidence to support the claim. Okay, so this, like I said, this flow chart, this is something that you're gonna to want to refer back to. Uh, there's no sense in memorizing it because you, know, you could use your notes during the exam. Uh, so you definitely wanna have access to this uh, as, a, as a guide you know, during the homework and then later during the exam. Okay, so like I said, determining whether or not to reject the null hypothesis should be the second to last step in the process. Stating the conclusion, that would be the final step or your final answer. Okay, so that does it for this video. I have a, a couple other videos posted in which I, I work through some specific problems on Excel. Please take a look at those. And if you have any questions, of course, as always, please send them my way. Okay, I hope this was helpful.